Well, good morning, Trinity Church. Uh, I'm recording this. Uh, I'm Pastor Dave Widerski, by the way, if you're tuning in and you don't know who we are. Uh, I'm Pastor Dave Widerski, lead pastor here at Trinity Church, and we are doing our video worship, filming it on Saturday for uh, the week of March 22nd, 2020. So I just want to welcome you to this service. It's been quite a chaotic few weeks. An invisible virus has caused worldwide upheaval, uncertainty, anxiety, fear, sickness, death to individuals and families and cities and nations. Our financial markets are chaotic. Our grocery stores have empty shelves. Restaurants and businesses are closed. Uh, People are losing their jobs. Our lifestyles have been disrupted. In times such as these, what is the Lord saying to us? What is the church supposed to do? Well, I want to just encourage all of you who are watching that we're encouraged by the Lord as Jesus' people in this world to continue fighting the good fight of faith. Satan does not want us to live by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or to listen to God's word during times of trouble, a pandemic and financial chaos. He wants us to do anything but trust the Lord Jesus Christ and look to the Lord Jesus Christ or to listen to God's word during these times. The Apostle Peter counsels the churches he oversees who are going through suffering and trials with these words from 1 Peter 5. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. That was 1 Peter 5, 6-9. through So he tells us to humble ourselves before the Lord in times of trouble. And how we humble ourselves before the Lord, Peter tells us, the Word of God tells us, is you cast all your anxieties on Him. On Him. And then you live in a sober-minded, a not a not a drunk-minded or a, or a chaotic-minded, but a sober-minded way, keeping your eyes on Christ and the Word of God. And to be watchful, knowing that the devil, your ad, our adversary, roams like a roaring lion during these times, seeking someone to devour. What does he devour? He wants to devour our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and our trust in God's Word as truth in times of trouble. So we're supposed to resist him firm in our faith. So the Bible tells us all over the place, when you are afraid, trust God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and trust his word of truth. The antidote for fear in the Bible is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and faith, confidence in God's word of truth to guide us through these times. David teaches us in Psalm 56 how to fight the good fight of faith in the Lord Jesus. He says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you, O Lord. In God, whose word I praise, in God I will trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Psalm 56, 3 and 4. We don't trust man, including ourself or this world or, or, or the lies of the devil. We don't live by trusting those voices. We live by trusting God alone and his voice alone. So, this is just a pastoral exhortation to us as Trinity Church and to anybody else who might be listening out there is that what we want to do in these times is we want to strengthen people's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and and help them to go to find what they need to revive their souls in the Word of God. 
So how, how do we strengthen our faith in the Lord and the faith of others during such a time as this? The Apostle Paul teaches us in Romans 10, 17 that faith comes from hearing. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ comes from hearing. And hearing, taking things to heart from the Word of the Lord. Uh, that is what I'm praying for us all during this time. That you and I and Trinity Church and, and Minot community, that we would humble ourselves before the Lord, cast all our anxieties on Him, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as our sovereign shepherd, and read, meditate, sing, and listen to His word of truth, thereby strengthening your faith in Him and pointing others to Him as their ever-present help in times of trouble. Let's just stop and pray. And that's why, no matter what's going on or what decisions the elders make moving forward, we will each week have a new, fresh video message from the Word of God, just as we had planned and just as I have planned out uh, each week, because it's so important to us that, that we cannot stop preaching the Word uh, to you, the congregation, or, or, into, or, or ministering the Word into our community at such a time as this. That's what Satan wants us to do. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, come into your presence right now in this worship time. Lord, I pray that you would connect through the video waves, through the internet, through uh, uh, how people are watching this. I pray that as people gather as either family units or a, a, as an extended family of Trinity Church that maybe meet, is meeting in homes uh, Sunday. Uh, however, Lord, you're doing this, Lord, I pray that you would minister the word of your truth and that you would give us greater confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is sovereign over all of this, and in your word of truth being the answer to any of our life's problems. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you You shine out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you, not like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power.
Turn it for our good and for your glory. 
world is broken down. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see?
Let us go to the Lord in prayer. I'm reading from the Valley of the Vision. Help my infirmities when I'm pressed down with a load of sorrow, perplexed and not knowing what to do, slandered and persecuted, made to feel the weight of the cross. Help me, I pray thee. If thou seest in me any wrong thing encouraged, any evil desire cherished, any delight that is not thy delight, any habit that grieves thee, any nest of sin in our hearts, then grant us the kiss of thy forgiveness and teach us to walk the way of thy commands. Deliver us from carking care and make us a happy, holy people. Help us to walk the separated life with firm and brave step and to wrestle successfully against weakness. Teach us to laud, adore, and magnify thee with the music of heaven and make us a perfume of praiseful gratitude to thee. We do not crouch at thy feet as a slave before a tyrant, but exalt before thee as a son with a father. Give us power to live as thy child in all our actions and to exercise sonship by a conquering self. Preserve us with the intoxication that comes Preserve us from the intoxication that comes of prosperity. Sober us when we are glad with a joy that comes not from thee. Lead us safely on to the eternal kingdom, not asking whether the road be rough or smooth. I request only to see the face of him we love, to be content with bread to eat, with raiment to put on, if I can be brought if we can be brought to thy house in peace. Lord, we come to you in prayer, thanking you that we can trust you. You are sovereign over us. We thank you for the fact that we can trust you. You will not let go of us. You hold on to us. You hold us fast. We thank you for that. And thank you that you are our God. You are sovereign even when we are anxious, anxious about things like COVID-19, COVID that you, you have told us that we can trust you. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We need that. We need your peace to guard our hearts. We do become anxious. The, when the things that we trust in as being always the way it is change, we become anxious. But we know that you do not change. We can trust in you. And so we do. We reach out to you as your sons and daughters, desiring for you to comfort us, to give us hope. And you have done that in your word. And so draw us into your word, we pray. Teach us from your word. Help us to know you better, for you do not change. You do not get sick and not respond to our calls, to our cries, to our concerns. I pray that your word would be proclaimed now this morning, uh, that we would hear from uh, what you would have to say. I pray that would be true also at Calvary Alliance, that your word would go out and produce fruit, that we would learn how we might love you better, we might know you better, we might serve you better. We thank you that you are trustworthy now. And pray that as we are going through these next days and weeks, that we would lean on you and not ourselves. For that is where our strength comes from. We thank you for this. And give you all the praise. Amen. All right, welcome back. Welcome again. Uh, I'm saying hi to you again. Uh, please turn in your Bible, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
Uh, we're going to start reading with, chapter, with verse 13 and go through chapter 3, verse 5. So uh, this is in preparation for the message this morning, which is entitled, Standing Firm in Christ and Gospel Truth During a Pandemic. Standing Firm in Christ and Gospel Truth During a Pandemic. Hear the word of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the firstfruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this He called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Let's pray as we come to the Word this morning. Heavenly Father, we do come into your presence right now. We want to, wherever we're engaging with this text, Lord, we want to bow our hearts and our minds before you, Lord, and before your Word. We ask, Lord, that you would teach us, that you would revive our souls through these words from you to us here today. Lord, uh, do that work that only you can do through your word uh, and bring the encouragement, the rebuke, the transforming of our mind that we need to be a people that truly honor and glorify you, Lord Jesus, and uh, minister your word of truth and minister your gospel to people at such a time as this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the midst of this uh, coronavirus pandemic, and, and preaching through First and Second Thessalonians, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ keep ringing in my ears. He said in Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, Fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Those words seem to maybe give us a little perspective of what we're going through here and that the important part is, how's your soul doing? How's your soul in relationship to God through faith in Jesus Christ? And how's your soul doing and being revived by the Word of God? The Word of God, the law of the Lord is right, Psalm 19 says, reviving our soul. If you want your soul revived, you need to go to God and His Word and His commands found in His Word, the Bible. So how's your soul doing? And then the second thought I've been going through my mind this past week or so is the words of the Apostle Paul who said, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Philippians 1.21. He's facing, he's in prison, he's facing, and he's pretty sure he might be executed for his faith in Jesus Christ. So he's contemplating what's better. And he says, well, either way, it's about Christ. If, I, if I'm going to live and carry on, then I'm going to live for Christ because he's my life. And if I die, it's gain because I meet Christ face to face. So for Paul, it was easy. 
Jesus himself says that he alone is the life. Life, true life, abundant life, in the midst of sickness and economic disaster and death is found only in Jesus. If we have been saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in the Lord Jesus Christ alone, if we have come to love the truth of God in Christ, the gospel, then nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. That includes a pandemic or economic ruin or loss of a job or hunger or political chaos and political corruption or upheaval or death. Knowing Christ, worshiping Christ, following Christ, loving the gospel truth of God in Christ, marveling at the glory of Christ, this is life, eternal life. Abundant life, real and eternal life with God in His kingdom forever is found in the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. Right now. Right now. The Apostle John sums it up well at the end of his Gospel writing, quote, John 20, 30-31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, by believing, by your faith in Him, the righteous will live by faith, by believing in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of, the, Son of God, in your everyday life, by believing you may have life in His name. So the center of our text in 2 Thessalonians today is 2 Thessalonians 2.15, which is asking us to, to stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ, in our hearts, set Him apart as Lord. That's what's standing firm in Him till the end, even in the midst of craziness in the world. And to hold firm to the traditions that you were taught by us, Paul says, which is the apostle teaching, which is the Word of God. Hold firm to that. So 2 Thessalonians 2.15 So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by spoken word or by our letter. That's going to be the centerpiece of the text this morning. So the Apostle Paul is a pastor, is a pastor teacher who loves the church, has been seeking to calm their fears and correct their doctrine in light of the day of the Lord, the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is seeking to ensure them that it is well with their soul, even amid the suffering and chaos and opposition they are facing in the world. Certainly, that is the job of all pastor teachers in troubled times. He specifically tells them, in light of the doctrine of Christ and the gospel and the second coming, that they were to stand firm in their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what comes, and hold tightly to the apostles' teaching about the truth of God in Christ Jesus, which is the gospel truth. No matter what happens, no matter what comes, hold tight to Jesus Christ as Lord and hold tight to God's Word, to the Gospel as God's truth. So our text this morning from 2 Thessalonians 2, 13-3-5 will never be properly understood except in the context of the glory of Jesus, Christ Jesus at His second coming. The day of the Lord Jesus Christ is about the glory of God being seen in its fullness by all mankind. Our blessed hope is the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's hope for us today. As you look to Christ, you look to His second coming, and you look to that day when He will come before, when He will come, uh, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His might when Jesus comes on that day to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at 
among all who have believed. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, 10. That picture, that glorious blessed hope in Christ that He's coming to make all things new and wipe out all evil and sickness and death and everything out of this world and to remake it in His image in a glorious way. That day should give us hope for going through things like pandemics right now. Martin Lord Jones in his book, The Final Perseverance of the Saints, talks about the purpose of the last judgment. He says, what is the purpose of the last judgment? There is only one answer. It is for the glory of God. It is the final assertion of the glory of God in the presence of those who have not given Him the glory. The Bible says this, and for this reason, the essence of sin is that it refuses to give glory to God. When Satan stood up against God, he was attempting to detract from God's glory. But the glory of God is supreme. It is over all. And redemption, salvation, will not be complete until the glory of God is again finally and completely established. And the glory of God is manifested not only in the salvation of those who belong to Him, but also in the punishment of those who have persisted in rejecting Him. So that's the context in which we come to this text this morning. So when Christ returns, those who refuse to love the truth of the gospel of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus will perish. And the Bible defines that as suffer the wrath of God in eternal destruction. Only those who love the truth of the glory of God in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved and enter into eternal life. Certainly a hard time like this where people are suffering and death is imminent. We want to remember as our Lord Jesus told us, you know, don't fear those who can only destroy the body. Don't Fear a sickness that can only destroy the body. Make sure you're asking the question, is my soul right with the Lord Jesus Christ? And is my soul living and loving the truth of the gospel and living the gospel truth in my daily life? So the Apostle Paul in our text this morning wants us to believe firmly in the truth of God in Christ and then live out the truth of God in Christ with our everyday lives. He wants us to know the Christ-exalting, gospel-centered truth of God in Christ, the doctrine of our salvation, and then live out the Christ-exalting, gospel-centered truth of God in Christ by standing firm in our faith in Christ and God's word of truth even in the midst of the hardships of this life. So, we get to our text. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. This is the first part of that. So it's doctrine. We have to understand doctrine. And then we understand how we are supposed to live. Doctrine and life always go together. You can't separate them. Martin Lord Jones says that this. Uh, uh, he says in the New Testament, in New Testament teaching, we are first of all given the doctrine, the teaching. Then we are told that we have to apply that to our personal circumstances. Obviously, if we do not know the doctrine, we cannot apply it. If we lack an understanding of the teaching, we cannot put it into operation. First of all, we have the instruction. We must receive it and understand it. Then we say, now, in light of this, this is what I have to do. That is the New Testament doctrine of sanctification. And that's what Paul's getting at here in our text this morning. So, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, 14. Let's look at that again. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this He called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So, so Paul is saying here to the church in Thessalonica, to those who truly are keeping their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and keeping in love the truth of God in Christ, the gospel, the word of God, he's saying to them that they, because of those two things, they are the beloved of the Lord. And they need to know who they are in Christ so that when stuff happens or they, 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 you know, the hardships of life come, they don't walk away from faith in Christ, but they walk deeper and further into it. That's what he's telling them there. So that, he says at the very end of verse 14, you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means that you may go to heaven to live in the presence of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever when He comes on that day to be glorified by His saints and to be marveled at by all who have believed in Him, trusted in Him as their Savior and Lord. So, but we ought always to give thanks for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord. That's how he starts off. So if you or I are truly saved, we are at the moment of our salvation fully justified, made right, declared righteous before God. Fully justified on that moment before God. And at that moment, we now start the process of being sanctified, being made holy, being conformed to the image of Christ as we submit to Him as Lord and we submit to His Word as the authority in our lives, then He, through the Spirit, transforms us as His people as we walk with Him in this life. So Paul starts out in verse 13 with, quote, but we ought to give thanks for you who are brothers and sisters, beloved of the Lord, pointing out the contrast between those he just talked about uh, who are, quote, perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Only people who love the truth of God in Christ Jesus and submit to Him as Lord willingly, gladly, with great joy and, and submit to the authority of God's Word of truth, the Bible will be sanctified and those, only those who are being sanctified show that they've truly been saved. They've truly been justified before God. They are truly His people, the beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ in this world. <clears throat> so, these people who are perishing that Paul talked about in the previous paragraph might have known the truth of Jesus in their heads, but they didn't love the truth of Jesus in their hearts, and so therefore it didn't control their hearts or their lives. It hadn't penetrated their souls. They refused to love the truth of God in Christ Jesus, Paul tells us, and that's why they perish. Which means that they may have professed faith in Jesus, but they did not love Jesus Himself as Lord of their life. They proved by failing to, quote, love the truth that they were not the beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we want to ask is what does it mean to be the beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ? How does Paul know that the Thessalonians that he's talking to are the beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, uh, why should Paul and his crew always give thanks to God for the Thessalonians? Because they are the beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what does it mean to be the beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ? There's three things in this, these verses that we see. First of all, the beloved of the Lord are chosen by God to be the first fruits of His redeemed kingdom people in this world of any generation until Christ comes. God the Father, before the foundation of the world, the Bible teaches us, chose people to belong to Christ and to be conformed to the image of Christ. Ephesians 1, 3-6 talks about this. It says, and this is a little bit of a paraphrase and some quote, it says that God the Father chose us, those of us who have come to saving faith in Christ, chose 
people in Christ, uh, chose us in Christ, quote, before the foundation of the world, so that we should be holy, set apart, and blameless before Him. That's our justification. So those of us who have come to saving faith in Christ and now live willingly, gladly, under His authority as Lord, we show that we have been chosen by God before the foundation of the world. Peter talks about this. The Apostle Peter. He says that we are chosen people in Christ, quote, elect exiles, elect exiles, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to say, that's from 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2. Then he goes, Peter goes on to say in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, we, the church, those who truly belong to Jesus Christ in this world, are a chosen race, a people belonging to God, so that and we live differently, right? If we've been changed, if we've been chosen by God, and we've been changed and born again, then we start to live out a new life. In Christ, that's what he's talking about here. So that we were chosen by God and now we belong to God through faith in Jesus Christ so that we might declare the excellencies of Christ who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We are now his kingdom people. All people who have been chosen by God are now his kingdom people. And if we are living as his kingdom people, that shows that we've been chosen by God. We're the elect that he's talking about here. Go back to 1 Thessalonians um, chapter 1, 2 through 5. See how Paul describes it and how he knew, how he says he knew that they were chosen by God. 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 2 through 5. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mention you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you. Why? Because our gospel came to you, not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. They were changed. They were born again. They were no longer living for self. They were living for Christ. They were living by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were laboring and, and seeking to spread the love of Christ in the world. And they had great hope for their future inheritance that was purchased for them by Christ. And they lived with hope in the Lord Jesus Christ with their daily lives. That's how he knew they had been chosen by God. And they, now they belong to Him. So what does it mean to be the beloved of the Lord? It means we are chosen by God to be the first fruits of His redeemed kingdom people. And we are no longer a part of the kingdom of darkness, but we are part of the kingdom of light. And we start the process of sanctification, start living that way. That's why the next thing he says, what does it mean to be the beloved of the Lord, is number two, the beloved of the Lord are those being sanctified by the Spirit who live by believing in the truth of God in Christ. So go back again. We are always give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved of the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. How are you being saved? How do you know that you're, you've been changed, that you're different, that you're being saved by the Lord? Through, it's because you're going through sanctification by the Spirit and, you, and you're living by belief in the truth. You're being sanctified, present tense, ongoing action by the Spirit, and you're be living by faith, believing the truth. That's your present life. That's how we know that we've been, we are the beloved of the Lord in this world. The righteous, the Bible says, in Christ, shall live by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and God's word of truth. They're walking by faith. And that's not perfection. That's not sinlessness. That's direction. 
Is my life now, it was going this way, I was following and living by faith in myself or the things of this world or, or empty philosophies that didn't have Jesus Christ at the center, but now I'm going this way. I'm living by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my Lord. He is guiding my life. I listen and want to hear from Him in His Word about how to live, and that's my life. It's not perfect, but that's the direction I'm now going. It's a complete change of direction. That's what Paul's talking about here. The righteous will live by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and God's word of truth. Paul knows that they belong to Christ because God is saving them through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And then third, what does it mean to be the beloved of the Lord? The beloved of the Lord Jesus are those who are called through the gospel to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. They are being fitted by this life through that sanctification process for heaven. This world is not their home. They are living in this world, but by waiting for God's Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Titus 2, 11-14 is now the pathway of life for a true believer, a beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ in this world. They are being trained. We are being trained, those of us who know Jesus and are following Him, by the Spirit and the grace of God in Christ, quote, second th- or Titus 2, quote, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live upright and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, close quote. So Paul wants the Thessalonian church to know that he who began a good work in them will bring it to completion. That means he wants them to believe that Jesus is their justification and their sanctification. Jesus is the author and the perfecter of their faith. If we are his sheep, Jesus Jesus promises in John 10, he will never let us go. We are His chosen ones. He is sanctifying us by the Spirit through belief in the truth and will bring all His sheep home to glory in heaven. In Romans 8, Paul lays out how God the Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, sanctifies us and perfects us and grows our faith in Christ and God's truth in this life through the hardships and through the ups and downs. I just... I want to encourage you in your faith during these times in the Lord Jesus. You can trust Him. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. He will do that. He is your sovereign shepherd. Trust Him. Run to Him. Submit to Him. Bring your anxieties and fears to Him. He cares deeply about you. I want you to hear these words from Romans 8. 26 to 39. And if you are one of those who have been chosen by God and you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, this passage is about you. And I hope you find great confidence in the Lord Jesus because of it. Because that's what Paul wants for the Thessalonians and that's what I want for you. Romans 8, 26 to 39. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us. Us is the church of Jesus Christ, the beloved, the beloved of the Lord, with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, including pandemics. All things work together for good for those who are called according to God's purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's how God the Father is working in your heart. If He foreknew you, if He elected you from before the foundation of the world, then He predestined you at a certain time to come to faith in Jesus in order that He, the Father is going to conform you to the image of His Son. In order that, back to Romans 8, He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those He predestined, 
He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We as your people are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered in this world. Malachi 1, 2 and 3. No, in all these things, Paul says, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what I want you to know as your pastor. That's the doctrine of our salvation. That's what God is doing in you. He redeemed you, caused you to be born again, and He doesn't just leave us and say, okay, good luck, try to obey my commands. He gives us the Spirit who works in us through everything, works for our good to conform us to the image of Christ as we bow gladly to his Lord, Jesus' Lordship and we bow under the authority of His Word, which is how the Spirit works in our daily lives to conform us to the image of Christ. That's what the Bible teaches. Do you believe it? is my question right now. That's the doctrine, do you believe it, of our salvation in Christ. The second part of this passage, and we're gonna, this is going to go fairly quickly, I think, because it's just going to be some admonitions on how do we stand firm in our faith in Christ and the salvation that He's purchased for us and the sanctification that He's putting us through right now in order to fit us for heaven. How do we live a Christ-exalting, gospel-centered life in the midst of the world that is opposed to us and with pandemics and sicknesses and death still in this world. 2 Thessalonians 2, 15 to 3, 5. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by your spoken, our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. All that I read in Romans 8 was grace that was purchased for us in Christ. We don't earn it or do stuff to get it. He just gives it to us. Who gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. May He comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God, and to the steadfastness of Christ. Church, because we are the redeemed of Christ in this world, His kingdom ambassadors, we need to <coughs> excuse me, stand firm in our faith, unmoved in the midst of this pandemic or the failure of finances, in order to tell people about the gospel of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is our Lord's will for us in such a time as this. To stand firm is a present tense perfect verb in the Greek, which means that Paul is talking about standing solid and strong in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ 
and in the apostles' teaching, which is the truth of God, the content of our faith, the gospel, until the end. That's, that's what the perfectness of it is. It's a present tense, perfect verb. Present tense, uh, ongoing action. This is how we live, standing firm uh, in our faith and, and solid and, and in, in Christ. A- and it's perfect because as we live that way, we will be brought to completion in Christ. That's what Paul is looking for in their lives, the sanctification process to do that. So, how we live, church, we are to, to, to first of all, stand firm in the Lord Jesus and hold to the apostles' teaching. That was verse 15. Jesus teaches there are two ways to live in this life. Laying up treasures in heaven or laying up treasures on earth. Matthew 6. He keeps going in that Sermon on the Mount with with more of these comparisons about two ways to live. You can live as serving and worshiping God or serving and worshiping money, this world, or yourself. It's only two ways. You can live as anxious people, our Lord Jesus Christ says, seeking the kingdom of this world, or as faithful people, seeking the kingdom of God. That's Matthew 6, 25-34. We can live as wise people, and Jesus defines wise people as those who hear His words and His truth, the truth of God, and obey it and live it. Or we can live as foolish people who ignore the truth of God in Christ and take pleasure in rebellion and unrighteousness and disobedience instead. Matthew 7, 24-27. Stand firm, brothers and sisters, in the Lord Jesus and hold to the apostles' teaching. Stand firm, secondly, in the eternal love, comfort, and hope of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul wants for the Thessalonian church. That's what I desire for myself and for us at Trinity Church. And so that really just gets to, if I'm going to stand firm in the eternal love, comfort, and hope of God our Father... That means I have to live as a child of God, right? I have to live like a, in childlike dependence on my Father in heaven. Okay, I live like a child. And so if you have a good and strong and glorious Father and you're facing fears and difficulties and challenges in your life, what do you do? You run to the Father. You don't try to replace the Father. You depend on Him. And that's how you glorify Him, by depending on Him through the circumstances of your life and trusting Him as a good Father, a good Father who will provide you with love and comfort and protection when you need it and will work in everything for your good. So where do you look for help in times of trouble? God is our refuge and strength, Psalm 46 says. An ever-present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we do not need to fear. Don't see that as God angry with you when when he quotes, when he says that. He's not. He's saying that as a father to you. Don't run after things of this world where you think you're going to find some some comfort for your soul come to me come to me i'm here to help fear not isaiah 41 10 says fear not i am with you god says to uh, his people fear not i am with you be not dismayed for i am your god i will help you i will strengthen you I will cause you to stand upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. Trust that promise. Look for promises like that. And if you're struggling with anxiety, which the Bible assumes we are, (laughs) so quit hiding it. You're not hiding it from God or anybody else. Uh, Bring your anxieties to Him. Cast those anxieties on Him because you know He's good and He cares for you. And He will help you. 
He will strengthen you. He will give you hope in the midst of worldly hopelessness. You can trust Him. So stand firm in the eternal love, comfort, and hope of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> when I am afraid, I will trust in you. When my soul needs reviving, I will remember Psalm 19, that the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Stand firm in that love and comfort and hope. Stand firm in every good work and word. This is uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.17. Stand firm in every good work and word. Live a life of holiness in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God. We are God's workmanship church, the Bible tells us. Created. Trinity Church was created. You in Christ as a disciple were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which Jesus prepared in advance that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2.10 our Sovereign Lord Jesus isn't surprised by this pandemic. <clears throat> He's sovereign in it and over it. And He has work for us to do as His people, as His church in this world, in Minot, North Dakota, uh, 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 that He's already prepared for us. We just need to step into them by faith. Sovereign Lord Jesus Christ is not surprised by the pandemic and has good works for us, Trinity Church, to do to honor and glorify Him and minister the gospel to others in such a time as this. Peter tells the churches he oversees that we, they are strangers and aliens in this world who represent the Lord Jesus Christ a, 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 as His eternal kingdom ambassadors. We are to live as salt and light in the midst of the darkness in the midst of the pain of this world, in the midst of the decay of this world, pointing people to the hope of the world, Jesus Christ, and pointing them and saying that there's another way to live under the authority of King Jesus, under His rule and reign, which is what the kingdom of God is all about. <clears throat> Fourth, I believe, stand firm, praying that the word of the Lord Jesus, the gospel, may speed ahead. Verse 3, chapter 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. Finally, brothers, Paul says, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. I just want us to remember during this time that Jesus said that He is the Lord Sovereign Lord of the harvest. And He has, uh, has been and continues to seek and save the lost. And He will do this until He comes again. So this pandemic is an opportunity for the Word of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Gospel, to speed ahead. Pray for your family and friends and neighbors that they would come to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ during this time. Pray that they would be saved from the wrath to come, eternal destruction, which is far worse than any pandemic. Use these times to scatter gospel seed. Send the life-changing Word of God to people who are struggling with fear or discouragement or economic ruin. My words don't change people's lives, but God's words does because it's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and it will get to the soul of people. Spread the gospel seed. Spread the word. We've got texts and, and emails and things we can do when we're isolated that we can still unleash the word of God into people's lives. Do that. Ask the Lord for bring people to your mind, believer and non-believer, that you need to send those texts, uh, scripture texts out to or emails or a letter. Write a letter. What a great time to write a letter. Uh, as long as they can still deliver them. Uh, so do that. Be encouraged during this time, brothers. Stand firm, praying that the word of the Lord Jesus may speed ahead. And then last, stand firm in the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to do that both individually as disciples and together, praying and relying on Him for deliverance from wicked and evil 
in this world. That's 3, 2 through 4. I want to read that again for us. That we may d- be delivered from wicked and evil men. Pray that, that that would happen. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. So trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting Him as Lord, means that we know that greater is He who is in you than He who is in the world. Satan has evil intents for this pandemic. But God may mean it for people's eternal good. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind during this time. And live relying on the Lord Jesus Christ praying to Him and relying on Him for deliverance from wicked and evil during these days. So fear not, brothers and sisters, Christ is still on His throne. He is sovereign Lord over all. Run to Him, trust Him as your only refuge and strength, who is your ever-present help in times of trouble. Help your brothers and sisters, point them to Christ and His Word and His promises. Uh, to shepherd us to the end and then get the gospel seed out to people. That's what our job as a church is during this time. I'm going to close with just a quote from the article that I, I just, on the Desiring God website that everybody, I believe, I just would like everybody to read as your pastor. It's by Marshall Siegel called What Courage Might Corona Unleash? And I'm just going to end with a quote from his article and pray. The gospel is always drowned out more easily in peacetime. What is, is this quote from Charles? Uh, it's going to be a quote from Charles Spurgeon, sorry. The gospel is always drowned out more easily in peacetime. What is there to fear? But not in a pandemic. When a cholera outbreak came to London, Charles Spurgeon admonished everyone in Christ, quote, Now is the time for all of you who love souls. You may see men more alarmed than they are already. And if they should be, mind that you avail yourselves of the opportunity of doing them good. You have the balm of Gilead. When their wounds smart, pour it in. You know of Him who died to save. Tell them of Him. Lift high the cross before their eyes. Tell them that God became man, that man might be lifted to God. Tell them of Calvary and its groans and cries and sweat and blood. Tell them of Jesus hanging on the cross to save sinners. Tell them that there is life for a look at the crucified one. Tell them that he is able to save to the uttermost all them that come unto unto God by him. Tell them that he is able to save even at the eleventh hour and to say to the dying thief, today you will be with me in paradise. God has prepared good works for us. Ephesians 2.10 He has prepared us for days like this. He plans to show the immeasurable riches of His kindness through simple acts of Christian courage in a world paralyzed and consumed by fear. Father, in the name of Jesus, use Your church. And to that I say, Amen.